And it's now, okay. So it is our pleasure to have Silvia De Monte, uh, well, with us in quotation marks um, for this talk. So Silvia got her PhD in 2004 at the Technical University of Denmark, if I understand this correctly. Yep. She was then a postdoc on a Marie Curie fellowship um, at uh, ENS Paris. And since 2007, she's been there uh, with the CNRS uh, as a researcher. And she's also been a, a lecturer at ENS. And since 2017, she is, on top of this, also a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Biology in Plön. And I understand she commutes between the two places, um, at least when there's not a pandemic. Uh, and the, group, the title of the group is Dynamics of Microbial uh, Collectives. And the, the, the title of the talk today is Models of Nested Populations. How does collective function evolve? So the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to give a talk uh, in Palma again <laughs> after so many years. Uh, so as I was saying to Tobias uh, before, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. So this is the first time I talk of uh, most of the stuff I'm going to present you. Uh, so, well, I'm not sure I'll be able to convey every detail that is needed. Uh, so please uh, stop me if I forget to say something. Um, there we are. So my main, uh, let's say, not only my main interest, but what uh, uh, people marvel in uh, uh, nature uh, okay, now I can change the slide, um, is uh, the diversity and uh, um, at uh, many, many different levels. So here you could you see what could be the image of the tangle bank uh, that Darwin described uh, in the origin of the species. But uh, what is not uh, visible in this picture is that uh, in uh, uh, this uh, ecosystem, uh, you would also find uh, cells, uh, unicellular organisms, uh, you would find viruses, uh, you would find uh, uh, genes inside uh, the unicellular organisms. And all these different levels of organization in nature, they uh, evolve uh, as Darwin understood uh, uh, through the process of natural selection. Now, if you want to understand uh, how natural selection acts uh, at these different levels of biological organization, it is useful to try and formalize a bit uh, what natural selection is and does. And uh, a very uh, useful uh, insight uh, was provided by Lewontin in 1970, uh, who pointed out that necessary conditions for evolution by natural selection to happen is that there must be some variation among the units uh, that uh, evolve. These units uh, reproduce, and uh, there must be inheritance uh, of uh, some characteristic uh, of these units uh, from parent to offspring. And moreover, these features that are inherited must have some effect on fitness. And this is usually summarized in the expression heritable variance of fitness. And uh, this refers uh, in particular to what uh, uh, a philosopher of biology, uh, Minor Smith, uh, would have called uh, the Darwinian individuals. This, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this definition, however, it is somehow um, uh, hiding under the carpet the fact that in many practical situations uh, it is not so well defined what fitness uh, really is. And uh, this can become a problem if you want to apply this uh, to a specific uh, situation or to mechanistic models. For this reason, uh, uh, few people, uh, but I strongly suggest uh, this paper if you're interested on the topic, uh, have pointed out that actually one can uh, replace fitness by demographic differences. And in talking about demographic differences, one then thinks of differences in birth rates and death rates that are associated to different features of the Darwinian individual. So typical uh, Darwinian units or uh, individuals uh, are those that uh, you could uh, all have thought about, uh, like uh, genes, uh, 
cells and multicellular organisms. Here you find uh, a particular type of multicellular organism that is a multicellular yeast that has been evolved in the lab in order to for uh, selection for increased size uh, after selection for increased size was applied. Uh, so this different uh, levels have all been uh, considered by one or the other uh, biological thinker as uh, the really fundamental units uh, of uh, natural selection. And uh, we understand rather easily why these uh, levels uh, satisfy Lewontin's conditions. However, there are other levels of organization uh, where these uh, three conditions uh, are uh, more difficult to really to be reckoned with. For instance, think of biofilms that are composed by many cells and could be thought of as a sort of a multicellular organism. And even more so symbiosis, where you have the stable coexistence of organisms that can be very different and they persist in close association. And somehow, even if physical proximity is often uh, a feature of uh, organisms, uh, one could think of communities, uh, for instance, of planktonic communities uh, as also sort of organisms uh, in the sense that they interact very strictly by exchange of uh, metabolites and uh, chemical compounds. The feature of uh, these uh, microbial collectives uh, is that they are in general heterogeneous uh, and that they have uh, no really clear cut uh, spatial temporal boundaries. And therefore, it is uh, quite difficult to identify what is the parent uh, and an offspring of uh, one such uh, uh, collective or uh, organism, if we want to think uh, of it as a Darwinian uh, unit. Nonetheless, uh, more and more people uh, currently think about uh, microbial aggregates or microbial communities uh, as having certain features of organisms. And this is why they are called meta-organisms, super-organisms, sometimes just straight multicellular organisms or holobionts. So all this kind of terminology hints to the fact that these assemblies have some collective functions that are important or seem to be important for us. For instance, uh, uh, they are uh, diverse. Uh, th this is related to the heterogeneity I was talking about before. And this diversity uh, is connected directly to increased uh, primary production, uh, increased total biomass or population size, uh, increased stability, increased resilience. So these are all functions uh, that are typically attributed to uh, biological communities uh, or to biofilms, for instance. On the other hand, one can also think to actually leverage uh, the existence uh, of uh, interactions among cells uh, in nature uh, to select uh, specific functions. Uh, in order to obtain functions of human interest, like bioremediation or production of specific compounds. Another general problem that one has to understand is how do collective functions evolve? Do they evolve because, so do, do communities, for instance, evolve because of these functions or these functions are the byproduct of something else? And so this is uh, a question that uh, has led uh, evolutionary biologists and uh, philosophers uh, discuss for a long, long time. But one possible way to solve this is actually to try and see whether evolution of a collective function works in practice. And in order to do this, uh, one can go back to some uh, classical and now classically heretical um, experiment that was performed uh, um, to prove uh, that uh, selection can act at the level of groups. 
So this is not bacteria, this is hen. And it's an experiment that aimed at maximizing the production of eggs from hens that were kept in cages. So each cage contained a certain number of hens, and the possibility was either to select hens individually for best egg production, or you would select the whole cage of hens. And what turned out in this very interesting paper published in Poultry Science in 96 is that the selection at the level of the cage led not only the uh, hens in that cage to produce uh, as many eggs per capita as uh, the best uh, hens uh, selected otherwise. But also they, the author noticed that uh, if you put together hens that were selected individually, they will not produce all those eggs uh, because they will kill each other because uh, they are very aggressive. So, this uh, led people think that uh, you could apply the same kind of reasoning uh, to communities, uh, exactly as you select uh, hands uh, in a cage, you could imagine uh, that uh, our microbiota was selected uh, while being maintained uh, in, inside our bodies. And uh, this selection would act uh, for some properties that are actually useful in the interaction with a human host. The problem now is that uh, in uh, these conditions, uh, it is not completely clear uh, what is a parent and what is an offspring. But uh, we pointed out that uh, this is not necessarily such a big uh, deal. So the Lewontin's conditions uh, can be relaxed uh, in order to uh, accept a uh, more general kind uh, of units uh, that do not have uh, already the genealogical structure that is given by reproduction as we know it for metazoans or for plants. And indeed, uh, we argued that uh, one can think of evolution uh, by natural selection to occur in general in any population that uh, is uh, genealogically arranged in units that are identifiable over time. In order to make this a bit more concrete, uh, consider, for instance, uh, a community that is made of uh, particles. And here it is represented by every edge in this graph. Do, do you see my pointer, my, uh, my arrow? Yes, I do, I do. Yeah. Okay, right. So let's say each, each of these edges uh, is a community. And then you can select uh, in a, a number of different communities, uh, one that has uh, a certain property that you like. And then, uh, okay, I won't go in the details of this model, uh, but uh, what happens uh, is that uh, imposing uh, this uh, genealogy or this scaffold uh, on the communities allows uh, you to select properties that you would not predict uh, to be selected uh, if you consider just one community in isolation. And I will be more specific about this uh, later. So this idea is uh, theoretical, but uh, many people think of doing this and actually they are doing this uh, in practice and with microbial communities uh, because uh, they are pretty easy to handle. So what you would do is that uh, you start from uh, a number of communities that have uh, different composition you have uh, uh, a phase of growth uh, where you let them uh, grow to uh, in uh, nutrients, for instance, uh, up to a given uh, um, uh, final um, size or for a given final time. And at this point, uh, you measure a trait of interest. And on the basis of this trait, uh, you select uh, the best communities and use this uh, to seed uh, or to inoculate again a new generation of uh, uh, vials in this case, where this step typically involves dilution. And so you start this cycle again and again. And the idea is that in this way, you should be able to select better and better communities for the property you have been selecting. However, as pointed out in this recent paper by other Sanchez and colleagues, 
uh, this uh, idea that seems uh, so appealing theoretically uh, doesn't seem to be that straightforward in its application. And uh, people might say, well, it's just uh, dumb to think uh, that uh, you can select uh, for group level communities. But as you will see, there are other factors into play and uh, there are many, many parameters that have to be chosen for this uh, protocol to be set up. And basically the aim of my talk will be to go through some models that will uh, um, uh, be useful, hopefully, to try and understand uh, this selective process and how to select, uh, uh, how to choose a selection protocol that is most adapted to select for collective properties. So the rest of uh, my talk will uh, be basically telling you about uh, two models. I will first go very briefly through a first model where the community is composed just of two species. And this is uh, basically because uh, it is uh, the case uh, that so far has been uh, the easiest uh, to handle uh, theoretically, uh, but it is also complicated enough uh, for me to introduce a number of uh, things uh, that will be important in the second part of my talk. And then the rest of my talk, uh, most of it uh, will be uh, uh, about uh, species that are compu composed of uh, many species. So the first work uh, is uh, mostly the, uh, the work of a super brilliant uh, um, a student, a PhD, a former PhD student, uh, Guillaume Dussier, who is now postdoc uh, in Sydney, but virtually in Sydney and uh, in reality in Plön. Uh, and uh, in collaboration with uh, Amory Lambert and uh, Paul Rainey. So if you're interested in the details, uh, this is the reference. Um, the kind of question we were asking in this work uh, is uh, how do uh, communities uh, get to the point of being uh, really full-fledged uh, uh, Darwinian individuals? And I recall you that uh, one uh, uh, property uh, that was required by Lewontin is that there is a heredity of uh, the function uh, you are selecting for. So if you start uh, from some assemblage, uh, random assemblage of uh, species, uh, even uh, if you impose uh, uh, um, uh, from the exterior a selection and reproduction process, uh, you are not in general uh, guaranteed to have a heredity of uh, this uh, collective property. And let me explain this uh, with uh, a simple scheme. So let's say we start uh, from uh, a number, a population of collectives, and here the collectives uh, are the circles, and each of these collectives contains uh, particles that uh, are just of two types. They're the red type and the blue type. And these two types, uh, they, have, uh, they are not identical. They have some differences in their demographic parameters. Typically, you will have that one grows faster than the other one. So if you let uh, these collectives uh, mature, so to say, from this uh, initial state, uh, you will get, after some time, populations uh, that have uh, variable compositions in terms of red and blue particles. And let's say that uh, your target function is, uh, um, the, is the composition uh, of, uh, is a specific composition of this community. And what you would really like is to have half blue and half red particles. So you would like a collective that is purple on average. So let's say you select here the most purple collectives then you can propagate them to the next generation uh, saying uh, that uh, this collective, for instance, uh, uh, reproduces by dilution and seeds uh, these other three collectives. Once you have the new born generation of collectives, uh, then you start again with the ecological dynamics uh, and uh, you allow them uh, to grow again and then you apply again uh, selection. 
So in this way, you have a birth death process that occurs at the level of the collectives, but within collectives, you also have a birth death process that uh, uh, pertains uh, to every single particle type. Moreover, what you can do is that uh, you can allow particles uh, to mutate. For instance, uh, you might have two different kinds of blue particles or two different kinds of red particles. So the question here is, uh, if you want to maintain this purple color, how do you maintain it? So one way to maintain it. So first of all, I would like you to notice that in the moment in which you dilute down, for instance, you take this collective, you dilute it down and you let it grow again, you are not guaranteed that the collectives in the end will have the same color as the parent collective. And this is mostly due to stochasticity, both in the dilution process so if you sample just a small number of particles, you might have a biased starting point. But you can also have stochasticity in the ecological process of growth. So this is the reason why, in general, uh, you do not expect that if you start especially with a community uh, whose particles are in competition, you would uh, have uh, th that this uh, heritability comes for free. However, you can hope that uh, stochasticity is always by chance generating at least uh, one community that has the right color. And then you can keep selecting this uh, community of the right color, and then you are able to maintain the purple color in the population. This method that uh, is called uh, the stochastic corrector corrector uh, protocol is actually, uh, the, well, the yield is very small as, uh, as you can imagine. And it's also not very efficient because the moment in which you take away selection then the right color is lost. However, if you allow the uh, single particle properties to evolve, what you would see if you had a very, very long uh, uh, tree, uh, genealogical tree of the collectives, uh, is that uh, the collectives become uh, more and more concentrated, their phenotype becomes more and more concentrated uh, around the target color. So here you have collectives in populations that are ordered uh, between uh, the reddest and the bluest. So this uh, level at the, the, the collective level selection uh, combined with mutations at the level of particles allows selection to optimize a collective function in spite of the fact that within collectives, particles are competing with one another. Moreover, this process makes such function heritable. That means that when you take away here selection, the part, the collectives will still remain purple. That is what we were hoping for to describe this as full-fledged Darwinian units. And then also the stability of such, such function is increased through uh, these generations. Okay, let, uh, now, let me now switch gears a bit and I'll go to a more complicated uh, situation uh, that is when uh, instead of being, there being just uh, two types, uh, there are uh, S, where S is large uh, types, uh, different types of particles uh, within each of these uh, collectives. So this is uh, a work uh, that uh, was realized uh, mostly by uh, Jules Frebul, another super brilliant PhD student, uh, who is uh, co-directed uh, with uh, Giulio Biroli and uh, myself. And if you're interested in the details, uh, we just put up this uh, on the archives. So if you remember the previous model here, there's uh, the upgraded version of it. So instead of having just uh, two types, uh, you have uh, uh, S potentially S different types of particles within each collective. Again, you have an ecological dynamics uh, that connects uh, the 
let's say, newborn state uh, to the adult state. And the adult state is the moment in which selection is applied. Let's say that here you select these two communities and then you reproduce them. What we do in this case is, in order to make things a bit simpler, is that in the moment in which we reproduce them, we don't dilute them down, but we just make a copy and paste of the state of the, um, of the population. However, what we do is that after this, we mutate the interactions that exist among the different particle or species in this system. And these mutations lead to a new ecological equilibrium to be established after some time. Then what selection we see are just this adult state. So at generations that will be discrete in time. So for simplicity in uh, this model, uh, the target of our selection will be total abundance. So you have, uh, think of uh, an ecosystem composed of different kind of uh, uh, unicellular species. And what we want to maximize is something that is basically related to total biomass. In uh, the following slides, uh, I will uh, give you some uh, more uh, precisions uh, on uh, three aspects of uh, this model. First of all, I will tell you how we model the ecology. So how we go from, uh, uh, let's say, a newborn to an adult state. Then I will tell you how we choose the initial condition for our evolutionary process. And uh, uh, finally, I will tell you how we uh, decide uh, uh, to introduce mutations uh, in uh, uh, the interaction matrix of uh, the ecosystem. So the ecological model we use uh, is uh, probably most of you know it uh, better than I do. Uh, it's uh, the generalized disordered uh, lot cavaltera model. Uh, that describes uh, uh, a number S of uh, species that uh, each of which has uh, um, uh, density dependent uh, growth rate. Therefore, uh, in isolation, uh, they have a carrying capacity Ki and uh, their effective growth rate is influenced uh, by other species in the community through some coefficients uh, alpha j that uh, uh, determine the interaction between species. Uh, this uh, model was uh, uh, proposed uh, by Robert May uh, as uh, a useful model to study um, the ecology of uh, communities that are very diverse and of which we have no idea what uh, exactly the specific interactions are. However, we can specify the statistics of the matrix, the interaction matrix alpha. And these statistics will be important for the following. So there will be an average, a standard deviation, and a symmetric correlation gamma. And if you have no symmetric correlation, then this figure represents uh, a matrix uh, where the interactions uh, are, are uh, just uh, chosen at random. Now, that, uh, so this kind of equation has been extensively studied, uh, especially in uh, the recent years. Uh, and we know uh, that uh, if we look at the total uh, number of uh, individuals uh, in this community, uh, this number only depends uh, on uh, the average and on the standard deviation of uh, uh, the distribution I was uh, introducing uh, formerly. So there are different uh, uh, phases uh, in the phase space, uh, but in order to make things uh, simpler for, uh, for us, uh, we will start our uh, simulations that I'm going to show you next uh, by an initial condition that is of course random but is such that the community is stable and uh, uh, it is mostly 
composed by species that are competing with one another. So if you just look at this graph, uh, you can already uh, guess uh, that if you are selecting for an increase uh, in uh, uh, the total uh, number of individuals, uh, what you will uh, do in general, uh, what you expect uh, to happen uh, is that uh, mutations uh, will bring you to decrease uh, the average uh, interaction strength uh, and increase uh, the, uh, the, the, the variance, uh, the variability of the interactions. But now, before I go to the simulations, uh, let me uh, specify what are mutations in our case. So since we want to think of these communities as uh, basically uh, individuals or uh, organisms uh, to a certain extent, uh, we don't uh, consider muta mutating one by one each entry of the interaction matrix. Mm -hmm. What we do is that we mutate the matrix as a whole. And in doing this, uh, we have to be careful that uh, we do not introduce biases uh, in the way uh, we perform mutations. Indeed, uh, uh, so one of the tenets, uh, the really basic tenets uh, of, uh, uh, of biological evolution uh, is that mutations uh, are not only stochastic, but they're also unbiased. And the way to achieve this uh, is to replace uh, at the following generation, uh, the, the matrix alpha, the previous generation, through uh, uh, a perturbed matrix uh, that has uh, this uh, formula, basically, is uh, composed of uh, um, the variation with respect to the mean uh, at uh, time t that is perturbed uh, by uh, a stochastic term uh, that has uh, zero average uh, variance one and uh, correlation gamma that is the same as the matrix alpha. And in order for these mutations to have small effect on the function that uh, we are selecting, we choose epsilon to be small. Now, this is uh, the choice for the expected values of uh, uh, it, give, it provides us with the expected values for this uh, mutated matrix. However, among all the different uh, realizations uh, of uh, this uh, matrix, uh, selection will end up choosing only one. And this is the one that uh, maximizes uh, the total abundance uh, that is uh, uh, n uh, uh, scalar uh, one. Okay, let's see now uh, in a numerical simulation what happens. So across uh, collective generations, uh, what happens is that uh, apart from a few species that you see go extinct, the other species uh, increase their abundance, but it's not just the one species uh, that increases the abundance in, all, in order for the whole community to be more abundant. It is uh, many species, and as a result, uh, the total or average abundance uh, uh, increases uh, uh, and uh, even more and more rapidly. If we look at the statistics uh, of uh, the interaction matrix uh, across uh, uh, this uh, collective generations, uh, we find uh, as expected uh, that the average interaction uh, strength decreases, therefore, the interactions become more mutualistic and uh, the variance uh, increases. So we could think that actually we just uh, need, uh, we could see this uh, as a gradient climbing process uh, in, uh, uh, the, on the surface uh, of uh, total abundance uh, as defined previously for the random uh, matrices. But this is not true. Uh, so here I have uh, reproduced uh, the surface uh, that uh, for before was a heat map, and uh, uh, below the, the white uh, line is uh, the uh, total abundance uh, that you would expect uh, for a random matrix, a purely random matrix uh, that has uh, uh, average mu and uh, uh, variance sigma. Whereas the red line is the real uh, selective, uh, uh, sorry, uh, evolutionary trajectory. So there is something that is, go that is going on. The matrix uh, doesn't seem to be random any longer after some time. 
And another way to see this is to look at the spectrum of this interaction matrix. So we start here with uh, uh, most, uh, um, uh, well, all uh, but one eigenvalue uh, being uh, uh, part of uh, a circle in the complex plane and uh, one isolated eigenvalue that is uh, uh, the, the average uh, of uh, the average mu. As uh, generation pass, what we observe is that at a certain point there is another isolated eigenvalue that uh, comes out of the spectrum. And if you cut uh, this uh, um, uh, picture here and you plotted this in the complex plane, what you would see is that uh, in uh, basically at the end of evolution, you end up having a structure that is very similar to the initial structure of the matrix, but where you have uh, this uh, rank one perturbation that uh, uh, provides basically a global mutualistic interaction term. If we look at the, uh, the single um, uh, interaction uh, uh, coefficients, uh, we see that we go from uh, a matrix uh, that has uh, no apparent structure, apart from the fact that it is zero on the diagonal, to a matrix uh, that seems to be structured. And uh, here the structure is evident uh, because uh, we have considered only the species uh, that uh, have survived until generation 2000. And then we order them in uh, order of uh, decreasing carrying capacity. That is, uh, this species here is the one that uh, in isolation has the highest abundance. So we can uh, see that there is uh, some kind of uh, uh, correlation between the carrying capacity and, uh, uh, the, and the amount of change or the, the degree of uh, mutualism of the evolved uh, uh, species in the final community. That is to say that uh, the species that become more mutualistic uh, tend to be also those uh, that uh, uh, have uh, higher carry capacity. Now in the, the, the rest, uh, the remaining uh, five minutes, uh, I think I've left, uh, I, I will go very quickly through the why we, how can we understand this? And uh, so it's a bit of math. Uh, so if you want the details, uh, I point you to the publication. Um, so uh, we understand this uh, by looking, by writing uh, an equation for the, uh, evolution in time of uh, the total uh, biomass or the, the total number of uh, individuals. And uh, this equation depends on basically all the parameters uh, of the system. And in particular, what is interesting for us is, of course, there is epsilon, the mutation step, uh, and the number of different species, but it also depends uh, on the number of communities in a way that increases with the number of communities, uh, but uh, does not, uh, but increases uh, slowly when n is large. And it depends also on the intraspecific interactions that determine the initial uh, vector of uh, carrying capacities and also on the selection target. So this equation tells you that. Uh, um, uh, the, the total n will always increase because uh, is a product of uh, two positive numbers. And all of this is positive for big, for sufficiently large n, small n. But if you look at the specific uh, alpha, the entries of the alpha matrix, uh, then you see that, uh, of course, uh, some increase and some decrease. And those that will decrease, uh, that are those uh, that have uh, uh, become more mutualistic, uh, are actually related uh, to the effect uh, uh, that uh, uh, perturbation in the carrying capacity of uh, that species will have on the total number of uh, individuals. So the vectors uh, that uh, appear in these equations uh, 
and that I didn't have the time to detail uh, become correlated over time. And this makes so that uh, more abundant species uh, end up being those uh, that uh, are or have become more mutualistic. So this is exactly the same matrix I showed before, but this time it is ordered in uh, terms of uh, abundance of the species. So uh, this equation is difficult to, or um, I mean, impossible for us to resolve in general, but it can be resolved, solved in one specific case that uh, uh, allows to capture basically in a nutshell all the previously discussed uh, phenomena. Uh, first of all, the fact that the average decreases uh, linearly in time uh, and uh, um, something I, I didn't mention, but the fact that uh, this decrease, uh, the speed of this decrease depends on the symmetry of the interaction matrix. So for uh, it is faster for symmetric matrices, whereas uh, for anti-symmetric matrices, uh, where basically if you push up one abundance, you have to push down the other one, then it is impossible to evolve uh, higher uh, uh, total abundance. The second feature is that uh, the total function increases and diverges at finite time. Uh, and yes, it, uh, it's over. Yeah. Sorry. No, 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 no. Somebody, no, no, no. Go on, go on. Somebody just made some noise. Uh, okay, sorry. It, it didn't come from me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, so, and uh, and finally, we also find uh, this uh, isolated eigenvalue in the equation for, uh, for the interactions, uh, that is in this case, just uh, uh, strictly related uh, to the average, uh, which is not the case uh, when, uh, when you have, uh, sorry, I, I didn't mention this approximation holds uh, as long as uh, uh, the, the variance uh, of alpha is small. And then if you have uh, larger variances, uh, you will observe exactly qualitatively the same kind of behavior, but the, uh, this isolated eigenvalue will be not uh, in uh, such a direct uh, um, uh, connection um, with the mean. So what is uh, uh, interesting for us uh, is that this uh, term uh, that uh, comes out uh, in the matrix, uh, um, if you think of the lot Voltaire system, uh, as the approximation of a more realistic MacArthur model, where you have uh, uh, explicitly uh, described uh, interactions uh, through um, uh, resources, uh, then you could think of it as the emergence of an effective cross-feeding term. Okay, I'll just uh, uh, say briefly that uh, since in general, we don't have the leisure of knowing all, we might not have the leisure of knowing all the interactions uh, uh, for every couple of species, we can uh, try and infer the interaction matrix uh, uh, from uh, some statistics. Uh, and then it turns out that the matrix uh, that we obtain is actually also the most likely given uh, the population statistics. So we expect uh, uh, this uh, behavior, this uh, emergence of the isolated eigenvalue to be a generic feature uh, for uh, this kind of systems, uh, even though we can strictly show it uh, uh, just in some limits. Okay, let me go to the conclusions. Uh, so applying community level selection to complex uh, interacting communities uh, uh, is, uh, and this is maybe not a surprise, uh, able to optimize collective function, uh, which means that actually within collective conflicts uh, are not uh, all that important. We started uh, from uh, 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 a competitive uh, uh, kind of ecosystem uh, and we were uh, progressively displaced uh, towards a more mutualistic uh, ecosystem without these conflicts uh, being particularly problematic. So these uh, interactions that become more mutualistic uh, also imprint a structure on the evolved metrics. And uh, this structure 
is uh, surprisingly for us uh, 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 predictable uh, uh, statistically, uh, but uh, it is uh, actually unpredictable in terms uh, of uh, uh, the, the single uh, species. So if you started uh, with a slightly different community, you would end up with a community that has the same statistical features, but then uh, different then species will play a different role. And this is all. Muchas gracias. And I'm open for questions. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this uh, for this talk. So, are there any questions? As I'll, I'll again encourage the PhD students first to ask a question. Of PhD students, if, is there anybody who of the students who would like to ask a question first? No. Well, then anybody else wants to ask a question? Emilio, I think you're... Yeah, I, I want to ask something. In one of your slides, you presented some evolution. In, in the first example in which you dilute and then uh, rep uh, make reprodu reproductions of the, of the collectives, you showed an evolution in which the, the, the width of the... The, the diversity of the community was decreasing, decreasing. And I think you mentioned that if at some moment you stop the selection procedure, still the the composition remains uh, in a narrow range. Yeah. I don't understand yeah. why this should be the case. It's not will not recover the, some initial diversity. So so it will recover, but on evolutionary time on the evolutionary time scale. So if you did the same. Uh, for uh, the stochastic corrector, let's say that it is just uh, demographic stochasticity or stochasticity of dilution that uh, maintains the purple color, then uh, the moment in which you stop selecting, uh, you will have uh, that uh, uh, the communities will become either completely red or completely blue in uh, just a few collective generations. In the case uh, where you have uh, evolved uh, heritability, what happens uh, is that uh, you actually evolve interaction among uh, these uh, two particle types. So the adult state uh, will correspond uh, to an equilibrium, to an ecological equilibrium. Now, when you dilute, uh, even if you perturb the system, uh, the system will have the time to go back to its equilibrium within one collective generation. So within a few collective generations, uh, you will not see a big change of this equilibrium value. However, if you just uh, keep uh, mutating uh, the single particle values, uh, in the end, uh, it will spread again, but it will spread very, very slowly. So let's say you have some collective function that um, is not important any longer at a certain point. Uh, <clears throat> sooner or later, you will lose it. Uh, but this will be a long-term memory of uh, what happened uh, previously. Whereas mm. in the first case, uh, you just lose it immediately. Three generations and it's gone. OK, thanks. Okay. Any Anybody else would like to ask a question or make a comment? Yeah, well, I have one. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Very, very interesting. And maybe it's maybe it's stupid, but how do you choose for the selection rule at the at the population level? Is that is that easy to infer which kind of selection does I don't know nature does on populate on community? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. No, it's it's an excellent question. No. Uh, Actually, it's not easy, and uh, one could imagine that uh, there are many, many different functions that could be interesting to study. So in the first model I presented, uh, we chose uh, uh, the, the color, so the composition, uh, because we wanted a function that could not be provided by just uh, one type. So if you select for something that, can, that only blue particles uh, in isolation can do, then uh, you will have, uh, you will just select the blue collectives. So we wanted to have a function that was uh, truly collective. So where you really need two different uh, kind of objects in order to obtain this function. 
because this is a bit uh, the idea that people have, for instance, uh, when they want to evolve a new function in the lab, uh, they want to start from existing microbes, uh, putting them together, let them evolve uh, some kind of interaction, uh, and then get out something that uh, neither of those microbes uh, could do if it was let alone. Mm -hmm. uh, in the second case, uh, uh, actually, um, we have results that are more general than just this uh, total uh, uh, abundance. Uh, actually, you could uh, imagine that instead of selecting total abundance, uh, you could select uh, for a weighted sum of abundances, uh, uh, and uh, then it would ba basically give you the same kind of equations. Um, however, it is a very interesting uh, topic that we are starting to explore. Uh, what happens uh, if you impose uh, some strange uh, selective uh, goals uh, that uh, might uh, be really, really hard to attain, uh, like, I don't know, you know, negative uh, values uh, or uh, where you, you could have uh, that the system uh, gets uh, actually, uh, can't really remain close to this equilibrium uh, that we basically study with these equations. So it is something that uh, we we are uh, we are studying, and I think is very interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting topic. I see. Thank you very much. Welcome. Any other questions or comments? So I had one. You had like towards the end, or I don't know. There was a slight way this this quantity mu decreased linearly. You said in, in time. So I assume this is the mean of these matrix elements, right? Is that is that correct? Yeah. So why? So why is that? Do you, so this means that the thing becomes more competitive, right? No, no, no. It is becoming or, more mutualistic. So because uh, at the beginning in the equations that so you have a minus a minus. Ah, right. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So then I missed that yeah. because otherwise, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. No, no, trivial. Trivial issue. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. I. No, 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 no. Because I was going to say Boonin's papers say, okay, there, there are papers that say precisely that, right? That it goes up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's yeah, what yeah. you would expect uh, that it yes, decreases. Yes, yes. Uh, well, the fact that it decreases linearly, I don't know. I, I no, that I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I didn't have an expectation, but let's say, yeah, that it would decrease. Uh, but the fact is that it, de it decreases faster than right, right. it would, let's say, it, it, the, the fact that you have this, uh, uh, BBP-like uh, transition uh, right. makes so that uh, you can decrease uh, much more efficiently this uh, average uh, interaction strength because so of uh, of this uh, rank one perturbation uh, and this right. eigenvalue that gets out of the bulk. Right. So is this it, your work? Is that written up or yes? Or uh, yeah. in, in 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 what when when yes, do I find sorry. this? Sorry, I had. I missed. Uh, I mean, I may have missed the, the, uh, the relevant yeah. side. Um, sorry. I'm going and back. this is all in the same. Okay, right. There you are. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, well then. Okay, so no. Okay, so then. Yeah, all right, all right. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Yes, I. Well, I. I went uh, a bit quickly on the equations, uh, but anyway, they. They can be derived in more general terms than those uh, I have uh, showed you here. Right. 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 Okay, okay, thank you. <clears throat> any other questions or comments or uh, anybody would like to say anything? I'm just writing down the reference, right? eight, four, five. <laughs> um, yeah, I can send it to you. Yeah, no, no, okay, well, okay. <laughs> um, I'll find Julius. Um, so any other comments or suggestions for questions? No? Well, then uh, thank you again. Thank talk. you very much for having me. And now there, there's no other choice but to kind of close the session. So, but we can, uh, can give a, a round of virtual applause. Hello. Applause. But uh, <laughs> okay. thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.